Hello everyone, my name is Maddie. if you do not know that. If this is the first time you've been onto my channel, hello, make sure you press the subscribe button. I'm starting this new series called True Crime Tuesdays. I think that's the name that I want to keep, I'm not quite sure yet. But basically, I'm just going to be covering cold cases, just basically anything to do with criminology because I have a really big passion for that and it interests me a lot and I know that it interests a lot of other people as well. This case revolves around a woman named Mildred Horn, her son Trevor Horn and their nurse Janice Saunders. Just to let you guys know that this episode actually deals with a crime that was committed against a child. So if you don't feel comfortable with listening to that, that's totally okay. Just make sure you click off here because there will be lots of information about that. But if it does interest you, then keep watching and we'll get into it. So on the evening of March 2nd, 1993, 40-year-old Mildred Horn, which is also known to her friends as Millie, found herself in quite a difficult situation. Millie was the senior flight attendant at the American International Airport who was rostered on to flight 731 to San Juan, I think that's how you pronounce it, sorry, which was departing on the following day at 8.07 from Baltimore International Airport. And due to this job of, of being a flight attendant, Millie often needed to find some help to look after her children because she was away at some lengths of time. Although her 18 year old daughter Tiffany who was her eldest it wasn't a problem for her to find anywhere to stay when she was not around because she was actually at university in the Washington DC. The issue though with finding uh, Sita was for her twin children Tamiel and Trevor. Now Tamiel wasn't really a problem as she can just go stay at Millie's mother's house Though the problem was Tamiel's twin brother Trevor, who was also eight, obviously they're twins. <laughs> Due to Trevor having underdeveloped lungs, he needed to have a tracheostomy, I think that's how you say it, um, tube that humidified and gave him oxygen and that ran from another oxygen tank that needed to be with him at all times. So because of this, Trevor really needed to have a nurse with him to monitor his oxygen and his lungs 24 7 they often took turns in having 24-hour care for him so a nurse usually came in for night shift if Millie was having um, a flight during the night and would come in and every hour would take down his oxygen levels even when Trevor went to school he was accompanied by a nurse um, as again he needed to monitor his oxygen levels so yeah he just had to go to school with a nurse and he wasn't actually bullied for it i think people understood apart from him being intellectually and physically disabled he was such a cheerful and happy person and to everyone that knew him saw him as a very cheerful and loving little boy and he made exceptional progress in his classes he loved sport and he loved learning and doing all these little activities although he couldn't quite hear properly or see or speak he made exceptional progress in learning a few sign languages i don't know what he learned but he learned a few sign language movements and he also learned a few words which is from what the doctor said was literally going to be impossible but he you know, he moved mountains and he made that happen. And when it came to Trevor, Millie was known to everyone as a super mum. She was giving him unconditional love, support, anything that he needed, she would give him. And she was a single mum as well. So everyone thought that she was a super mum and she, she was. Millie and Trevor were always seen out and about. They used to stroll in the park in his wheelchair or that they'd be seen out driving in their modified Chevrolet freaking Astro minivan like they were just such a happy family that just defied all odds. Trevor actually made his own language up despite the doctors saying that he couldn't speak so he made L for Tennille which was his twin sister and he made Lala saying I love you so I think that is so beautiful. 
Trevor had a life support machine on as he slept. The constant monitoring of these machines are responsible for keeping him alive. The nurse rostered on to supervise Trevor on the night of March 2nd, 1993, called in a few hours earlier and told Millie that she was unwell. Millie then called her sister Vivian, who reluctantly had to decline as she also had work the next morning and couldn't obviously do a 10 hour shift at night. Millie couldn't take the shift either as she had to be at work the following morning. So she finally called another one of Trevor's nurses, Janice Saunders, who saw Millie's dilemma and said, sure, I'll come in even though it was short notice. So Janice had been work, Janice. <laughs> Janice had been working for Millie for about five years and she'd just developed a really strong fondness and bond with Trevor. So it was a no-brainer that she could come in and help as this was a really big dilemma for Millie. It was around 7.15 the following morning, March 3rd, where Millie's sister Vivian drove to her sister's house. It was only a short trip for Vivian as she lived a few blocks down. The pair resided in the coastal state of Maryland. So as Millie would have usually left for work, Vivian just expected to walk in and take over Janice's shift as she'd oh so nicely just came in so she didn't want to keep her waiting. So she wanted to quickly pop in and then take over and all was good. Although this did not happen, as you can probably tell. Upon entering the garage, you know, Vivian just got this overpowering fear and sense of worry. As things were so out of place, there were sofa cushions thrown all over the floor. And as she'd walked into the house, she had noticed the high-pitched sound of Trevor's apnea monitor. And for this to go off, it signifies to the nurse that Trevor has stopped breathing so obviously this is so scary because you're not supposed to hear this sound it was an unfamiliar sound to that household she ran to the next door neighbor's house and knocked on the door and begged them to come into the house to investigate and see what was wrong because obviously something was not right everything was out of place so they were at the door and they were banging on the door trying to trying to get in and they was they were pushing on the door and as they were pushing on the door they realized that something behind the door was keeping them from coming in. So Vivian peered through the door and she came across Millie's fixed, unblinking stare with half of her face missing. So police had arrived minutes later after Vivian had called 911. They had immediately found Millie's body lying at the front door in her nightgown. It appeared that she had been shot in the face with a high powered gun at close range. As the officers were following the sound of the beeping, it led them upstairs to Trevor Horn's room. Now this room was squeaky clean, it was orderly, it was, it just mimics a hospital room. But apart from that, they walked further and saw Janice Saunders' body on the floor covered in blood. Jenna Saunders had also been shot dead two times in the face at close range with a high powered weapon. Two small abrasions above Janice's left eyebrow looked to have been caused by a silencer. Officers approached the specially built crib like bed beside the beeping machine. Each beep signified that each breath was missing from Trevor and lying inside of his crib covered with his stuffed toys was little old Trevor who had no external signs of trauma although he did have a few speckles of blood in his eye as a result of violently trying to breathe before his death. It appeared as though Trevor's killer had plugged his tracheostomy tube with his finger that ultimately suffocated him. They had also hypothesized that as they were blocking the tube with their finger, they also covered his nose and his mouth to furthermore suffocate Trevor. A few areas in the house were obviously disturbed. Um, a cocktail table was pushed aside, cushions were thrown, rugs were kicked to the side of the house. Scattered on the floor was Millie's purse. 
Our bookcase was toppled over and a hallway closet was also ransacked and pushed over which opened up the drawers and left its contents all over the floor. In the basement, the screen window was pulled away and there were pry marks all over the frame. So from the messy state of the house to the pry marks all over the window, police just kind of gathered that it was also a really horrible burglary that went wrong. Though if it was a burglary, it was a pretty incompetent one as they hadn't taken anything that a particular robber would usually take. They didn't take any televisions, they didn't take any jewelry. There was a five carat diamond bracelet sitting on the bathroom sink that they didn't take. The purses, not, nothing was taken. So for a particular burglary, it was quite incompetent and it wasn't a usual case. So because of this, the police hypothesized that maybe it was a staged burglary because the killings were efficient. They were well thought out and planned and very premeditated. So the fact of them trying to cover it as a burglary proved how smart they were, or they thought they were. Millie was killed with three gunshots to the head and Janice was killed with two. Young Trevor's death was senseless. He couldn't tell anyone what had happened. He couldn't identify the person. There was no reason to kill him, yet the killer decided to as well, which made him just that much more dangerous. Forensic went over the worn house with a tooth comb. They couldn't find anything. They couldn't find footprints, fingerprints, um, any any evidence at all that could help break, you know, a lead in the case. The forensics found two types of evidence: found fragments of a 120 caliber bullet lodged in between Trevor's wall. This was useless. Second piece of evidence that was found was a file that was covered by tape at the handle that was left in the garage door. This also left the officers with nothing, although it did test positive for gun residue. Actually, another thing that they found was a bit of grass left on Travis, or Travis, left on Travis' face. They just put that and bagged that into evidence. Thanks to Janice's logs of the hourly vital signs of Trevor, they could they could exactly pinpoint on when the murders occurred. The last log that Janice had put in was at 2am 2, 2 in the morning. So obviously sometime after 2am the intruder came in through the basement window and murdered Janice, Millie and Trevor. Millie's... Millie's... <laughs> It's a tongue twister. Millie's minivan was found located about a mile. I'm not sure, I don't know what that is converted into kilometers, but I'm just gonna be talking miles because that's where I found all my information from. So Millie's minivan was found a mile from the house at about midday, which was located at a townhouse construction site in a suburb called Lake Hill. Investigators started to believe that the killer had driven to the same construction site and parked their car and walked to the Horns house and then after he did the you know malicious killings he took the minivan back to where his car was and just left it there. Later that afternoon Millie's credit cards were found. I forgot to mention before but yes the intruder for the intruder took a credit card and a cash card with him to further you know, make officers believe that it was a burglary. So they took the cars, but they later were found by a jogger in the Montgomery County around at, after midday. The jogger said that he found the cards scattered on the side of the road, so the killer must have just thrown them out the window. As the house was being investigated, other officers went to Howard University, which is where Tiffany went to school, and told her about the unfortunate death of her mother and her brother. Upon hearing her mother and brother had just been murdered, the 18 year old blurted out to officers, my father had something to do with this, didn't he? Now this kind of raised a little bit of alarm bells as officers had no idea that the father wasn't in the picture, but also as they now have a suspect that they can start talking to. So this brings us into the section where we talk about, you know, who could have done it, just suspects, and what happened after the murders and if they got resolved. Let's just start from the beginning. So the main suspect for this murder case was Lawrence Horn, who was 
Millie's ex-husband and Trevor's father. A bit of a backstory on Lawrence, he was a sound engineer at Motown Records Hitsville in Detroit. He was the chief technician for musicians such as The Temptations. So after a brief one year relationship and marriage with his receptionist Joanna Royster, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, in the early 1960s, he moved to Los Angeles with Motown when in 1972 he met the lovely Mildred Marie during his first class flight to Los Angeles. The couple married in Las Vegas in August 1973 but they separated in 1979 and filed for the divorce in 1981 although they did continue their relationship by their daughter after they filed for their divorce. So because of their previous love with each other they actually you know were doing the sneaky with each other so in 1984, Millie actually discovered that she was pregnant with Horn's children and she was pregnant with twins, later to be known with Trevor and Tamiel. As the music industry kind of changed from musicians like The Temptations, it kind of manifested into pop culture. So he got laid off in 1990 and he was just swimming in debt, particularly with $16,000 that was supposed to be owed in child support that he had not yet paid. Sorry if the frame is all over the place, I just had to quickly charge the camera up a little bit because it was going flat because I'm talking too much and stuffing up too much. <laughs> but basically there was no other suspect in the police officer's mind apart from Lawrence Horn who was, as you know, Millie's ex-husband and Trevor's father. Lawrence wanted nothing to do with Trevor because he was intellectually disabled and he was paraplegic and this further you know made police officers want to go and talk to Lawrence to just figure out where he was and what he was doing basically to get his alibi. So weirdly enough when the police rocked up at his house Lawrence gave him a recording of him taking a snapchat or taking a, not a snapchat, there was no snapchat back then, but taking a video of him in front of the TV on the news showing the exact date and the exact time that he was at home. Which was extremely, extremely unusual for police to see that he had just randomly recorded himself at the exact same time that his family was being murdered. So this heightened their, you know, thoughts even more that he definitely had something to do with the murders of his family. So a review of telephone records showed that on the night of the murders, two phone calls to a Montgomery payphone were received. One was traced to the Days Inn on the Shady Road where a James Perry had registered that night. So basically, Lawrence and this fellow James had, a, had two phone calls on the night of the murders suspiciously. So another thing that was a bit sus in the case that it just showed that there's no doubt in the police officer's mind now that Lawrence definitely had something to do with the murders. So this big discovery of all these phone calls from between Lawrence and James sparked up a massive FBI wiretap and surveillance of these men and it also uncovered another man in the mix. His name is Thomas E. Turner, who was a cousin of the Horn family. He was the one who had introduced Horn and Perry, and he was the go-to man who would give messages to each person as they didn't want to be, they didn't want to have a track of records showing that they had been talking on the phone. So they used Turner as the inside man and the between man kind of thing. And as testimony was you know justified by 709 prosecution exhibits these were mostly telephone records and an answering machine tape that was recorded of messages as well and that had captured perry and horn talking on the telephone answering machine so i'm going to tell you now exactly what happened and why he felt the need to hire a hitman to murder his family. If you didn't catch on to that or if I explained it horribly, this is my first video so just bear with me and I'm obviously going to improve more in the future. Prosecutor said that Lawrence was getting just so annoyed with the way that 
Millie was living and how comfortable she was because he was living in debt in a really seedy part of Hollywood so he was just envious of the wealth that she had. So years prior to this and another reason to why Lawrence wanted to murder his family was that Millie had sued the children's hospital and had won our malpractice law due to a botched surgery that had happened which left Trevor with further injuries. So because of this malpractice law and that she won, $1.7 million was put into a trust for Trevor and Lawrence wanted it. He was so greedy that he wanted his own son's money. <laughs> he needs that money. He is severely, severely disabled and you want to take the money that can help him and make him comfortable and seemingly happy away from him. He also wanted to get the life insurance of Trevor, which came up to $2 million. So this further sparked his, you know, drive to kill his family for his literal greed of money. As he confided into his cousin about how angry he was he wasn't having any money, the cousin referred him to a spiritual guidance counsellor named James Perry, who, you know, the, this introduction would lead to the murder of Janice. Millie and Trevor. James Perry literally followed a book called The Hitman, a technical manual for independent contractors, which was essentially a book step by step listing things to do to successfully, you know, to successfully kill someone in a hit. For 130 pages, um, prosecutors said that each step you know, scarily related exactly to how the crime scene was and how the murders and the weapons and everything took place. Lawrence paid Perry 3,500 to five grand for these hits, which to me is just so stupid. Like you, you are killing three people for five grand. I don't understand how psychopathic brains think at all. So the author of this book, The Hitman, stated that you know you should use this, like a middleman to talk to to not bring up any attention but the one thing that perry did wrong is he used his real identity with making a transaction at the hotel that he was staying at which was a good move for the police and for us to find out what happened but for him he didn't follow the book to the t that was the only thing that really stuffed up the plans for Lawrence. It was the summer of 1992 and Lawrence had just contacted his eldest daughter Tiffany who he had usually kept in contact with and asked to see Trevor and she was quite you know bewildered by this because she didn't understand why the sudden need to see Trevor but you know accepted it and thought that he was trying to make a change in the family and try to be more you know in the picture. But because of this and because of the beef that happened between Lawrence and um, Millie, she had said to her whole family not to let Lawrence in the house or near Trevor at all. I'm not quite sure why this was, but Tiffany took that into account. When Lawrence had asked to see Trevor, she said no. He wanted Tiffany to record inside of his room and to record inside the house and to see Trevor. From downtown Washington to Silver Spring in Maryland, it's about a 30 minute drive and Lawrence had recorded it all. And he'd recorded outside of the house and zoomed into every window to show James Perry where each person's bedroom was. The reason that he wanted to see Trevor was to actually record inside the house so James Perry knew exactly where to go and there was going to be no surprises in there. He wouldn't be going in blindsided. Although in court, Horn stated that he videotaped his entire trip just to show his family back in California, which to me is just so stupid and such a blatant lie. Police found in Horn's pockets flight times and dates and the exact flight that Millie would be on to give to Perry to tell him when she would be out of the house. So about a week after the murders, one of Millie's flight attendant um, 
co-workers came to the Montgomery police and told them that, that Millie had feared that her husband would come and kill her and if she ever died to tell the police that he had something to do with it. So Millie obviously had some, you know, some thought to that something could go wrong. On March 12th, police had raided Horn's apartment and they had gotten audio cassettes, his laptops, videotapes, anything that can incriminate him. Receipts had shown that Horn had made several made several trips between Detroit and Maryland, which was also really suspicious and another really suspicious thing that Lawrence that Horn had done was he had called Millie the night of the murders to see where his children were essentially to gather and tell Perry who was going to be in the house and if his children were going to be there and be murdered. The same search of Horn's apartment also showed a handwritten and hand drawn note of Millie's house and where all the bedrooms were along with the videotape that he had filmed a few weeks prior. After the murders he had immediately contacted the insurance company to get his money because it was entitled to him but Tiffany had told the police and the insurance company not to give him the money so he didn't receive any of the 1.7 million dollars and Perry never received a cent for killing Millie, Trevor and Janice. On Saturday, May 4th, 1996, a few years after the murders, Lawrence was finally found guilty on three counts of murder and one of murder conspiracy. It was said that Horn, who was 56 at the time, displayed no emotion at all during any of the court hearings, but the only emotion that he showed was when the jury had called that he was guilty for his son's death. Perry was sentenced to death and after these murder convictions the family also, as I think I previously said before, they also convicted the publishers Paladin Press for basically publishing a step-to-step -step guide on how to murder and produce a successful hit on someone. They filed civil wrongful death lawsuits on the publishers Paladin Press due to them thinking that it aided the death of their family, which is totally understandable. So to summarize this whole case, it might be a bit all over the place. Lawrence Horn hired James Perry for a hit against his family of Mildred Horn and Trevor Horn. And unfortunately, it was just the wrong time and the wrong place for Jenna Saunders as she also got murdered. The reasoning and motive behind this hit was because of money and it was because of greed and Lawrence wanted 1.7 million dollars of insurance and that is it for this case. I hope that made sense because this is my first one and it took it I've been probably recording for a few hours now like it's taken a bit to gather and understand on how this needs to be produced. So if you do have any comments or any constructive criticism for me that would be amazing. You can contact me in the comments or on any of my social media platforms and if you have liked this also give it a like i'll see you in my next video